Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Martha, too. It's great to, uh, great to hear from both of you. And uh, while my presentation's coming up, uh, I'll just introduce myself. As uh, Jill mentioned, I'm an extension engineer at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, I've worked in air and water quality with livestock systems uh, for quite some time and in the last uh, almost five years now have focused on climate change in animal agriculture. Um, so have worked with several controversial topics, as you can imagine, in this field and have really um, tried to focus on how do we best uh, communicate um, science uh, on these controversial topics because I think extension uh, really needs to be um, helping lead the way and you know kind of uh, focusing on how we can bring science to some of these discussions um, even though as we've seen from previous pre presenters you know that may not be what makes people's decisions, but we need to make sure that the information is there and try to have some clarity. So with this, I want to cover, I'm going to start out with some common pitfalls um, in communication and then wrap up kind of a process that uh, we've been using in our animal agriculture and climate change project um, that we found to be effective. So first off, some common pitfalls I, I've seen both um, by educators in extension as well as consumer advocates um, that we are great ways to start the conversation. Um, the first one is emotional appeals. You know, we're really familiar with um, seeing these in the climate change debate. You know, the, the, the polar bears are all dying or, you know, we're, you know the planet's going to be unlivable, kind of these doomsday scenarios, which they have a short-term hook. So there's some value there. Um, but if it's not followed up with some science, it doesn't really um, lead to any action. Um, these type of simple claims are often also wrong somehow, you know, it oversimplifies it. Um, we make them into these polarized issues. You're either with us or you're against us, you know, like uh, the other one here. Um, you know, it, it is true that calves are taken away from dairy cows, but, you know, in this case, it, using it as propaganda to pull on people's heartstrings kind of oversimplifies, um, you know, the life of the cow and calf are not necessarily worse because of that. But we have differences in values um, that are really apparent in this sort of thing. Um, the other challenge um, with emotional appeals is that um, we want to make sure that we use something that's more hopeful. When you focus on the negatives here, um, it's not very empowering to folks. And finally, uh, one of the challenges with uh, emotional appeals is that there's this um, thing in communication research they call the cycle of worry, where people can only really worry about so many things in their life. And you know, you've already got family and your kids at school and what's going on at your work. And you come home and you sit down to the news and you might be totally overwhelmed after watching 10 minutes of news. And so if we just kind of pile on to people's emotions, it, it really is disempowering or makes people feel overwhelmed and just want to step away from the debate. And the last piece I'll bring up here um, is I don't want to leave um, us in agriculture out of this. We, you know, um, we kind of do some of this ourselves. And I think it's really important to think about um, our values and our motivations and to be really aware of those as we start to do our programming. Um, the happy cows is the is the bottom one. You know, this is an advertising campaign, and it was really successful and really resonates with folks. But then, when they see um, a modern dairy facility, it looks so different than what we than what we always project in the in the advertisements. That um, it it's that um, cognitive dissonance that Paul brought up. It just seems wrong in some way because it's so different. And the other one that I hear a lot in our programming is is maybe an over-reliance on talking about feeding the world. There's, there's a, you know, there's a factual truth to that. There's a lot of people we need, you know, that are going to need to be fed, but it really kind of goes into some of those things. It, it oversimplifies the issue. You know, today we've, we have enough calories to feed the whole world today, but yet even in the United States, we have something like 15 to 20% of our kids are hungry in the U.S. And so, you know, it, it oversimplifies the issue. And often I see it being used 
um, to justify whatever comes next in the presentation. You know, so rather than talking about potential solutions to feed the world, we say, well, to feed the world, we have to do, you know, whatever we're bringing up next. So it's it's really something to think about how you know step back in our programming and think about how do we how are we using these and are we are we kind of tapping into the other side of um, pulling on people's heartstrings rather than uh, relying on some of the scientific data. So I, the next one that I that I want to hit on is a pitfall is uh, assuming that people are ignorant if they disagree. Um, Martha talked about this a lot, that um, disagreements can actually, you know, and controversies can actually be amplified by the amount of um, science that's brought to the table. So um, often people on different sides of a debate actually know quite a lot about what they're talking about. So assuming, assuming that they don't is, is not a great way to start the discussion with them. And next, I wanted to highlight, um, I've seen this done also in programming. You know, no matter how much we might disagree with some of the thought leaders on, on other sides of a controversy, um, starting out by insulting them is an offhand way of insulting um, anybody in the audience who might follow, um, follow these folks or have, um, respect these folks. Uh, as Martha was talking about, um, with cultural cognition, we look to others who are championing um, what we view as our same values. And so um, people identify with these folks. And I would actually suggest that as educators, we should um, you know, read what these folks are talking about and, uh, and really study it and try to understand their perspective because it will help us in our programming reach um, engage our audience as well. And the last thing I'm going to list as a pitfall is um, using some of the wrong terminology. And particularly for those of us coming out of the research realm, um, you know, we start to get into all the lingo. And even some of the really basic scientific lingo, I listed some here, you know, using anomalies or biases, you know, to an, to an average um, person that's not in the research field, the public meaning of these words is much different than, um, than what we intend. So we should really uh, look through um, our written uh, publications and also just as we speak, um, try to identify these and, and find clear words um, so that we're not um, perpetuating some misunderstandings. So with that, let's shift and talk about how do we really um, start to facilitate these discussions. I wanted to highlight a process that, um, that we found to be effective in our programming, um, and hopefully it'll be helpful for you as well. So to start off, um, meeting people where they're at is a really great way to start a discussion. So this is what Martha was talking about, about finding shared values. So even though um, different sides of the controversy might have um, different solutions, they probably have some um, values. So starting out by talking about what is it that we really value and we're really after. Um, and another way to do this is to add it into our existing programming. So when we've done climate change work, you know, there's a subset of folks who are really interested in um, climate change programming. But overall, you know, it's not something that draws a lot of people. So how do we integrate it into existing um, existing programming uh, rather than create new, totally new programming. Because one of the benefits that that brings is then we can look at, um, you know, really just looking at how does, for example, climate change, how does that impact your program area? So if, you know, in our manure management work, we can look at how does increasing rainfall change our manure storage plans? Or how do we, uh, you know, how might we plan for drought better in our, in our ranching programming? Um, so this is, you know, something that we are already doing in extension. So we can think about these controversial topics as a way to um, make our existing programming even better. And then, as Paul said, it's important to um, acknowledge the legitimate problems surrounding the controversy. You know, because in some of these, um, you know, like if you get into animal welfare, it's a new field of research. There's not necessarily scientific consensus on all of the um, 
all of the different solutions. There are some legitimate problems that research is highlighting. Um, so we need to acknowledge those things up front. You know, that helps build trust that we're not just here to um, advocate for a certain position and we're not trying to hide anything. So I think that's a great way to get started in the programming. And next we found that it's, it's really great to talk about, well, what's happened in history? How have we dealt with this controversy in the past? Um, leaning in on the climate change piece, we can talk about, you know, what are the trends for our region? You know, this is something that you can make um, really specific to a location. Um, it's really easy to document, and so that, that brings down the amount of uncertainty surrounding the issue. So we can talk about, you know, are there, how has temperature changed? How have, um, you know, how have our housing practices changed in the past? And then that kind of get people thinking about, well, we've already adapted to some of these things. And that puts it in the right frame of mind so we can think about, okay, we've already done some adapting. What are we going to do to stay relevant into the future? Whether we're talking about um, new technologies, whether we're talking about climate changing, whether we're talking about um, animal welfare changing standards. And the other piece is that this is a really easy conversation starter. Usually farmers love to talk about the weather. They love to talk about um, things they've done in the past. It lets them tap into their knowledge and um, see how they have overcome things in the past and how that might help them in the future. And the next step is this is where then we can start to add in new information. You know, this is a piece in extension we're really familiar with. Um, we want to make sure that we're using um, good analogies. So here again, going back to climate change, um, even to sometimes understanding the process is hard. So we can talk about climate, you know, global warming is like when you wrap up in a sleeping bag and it holds your heat in. So it's just a good analogy to use. Um, you want to use concrete data. You now we've talked um, a lot about um, some of the values pieces, but you know you have to have scientific data to back this up. You need to know what you're talking about, and it needs to be presented in a way that's easy to understand. So this one's looking at changing frost-free dates in a nice map visual, so people can bring it to their specific location really quickly. And then we also want to tie in the vivid imagery, like Paul talked about. Um, we're very visual creatures, and so the the more visual we can make it, you know, like seeing those impacts, seeing um, erosion, seeing um, what different housing systems might look at really helps people kind of, um, identify with, with the different issues. And then the final step is then to present potential solutions. And so this to me is where, um, you know, we want to present a suite of solutions that are backed by science. And so um, rather than saying that, you know, kind of getting into that, you agree with us or you don't, you know, kind of that um, conflicting, uh, where it's easier to have conflict when it's one way or the highway type uh, messaging. It's let's look at a suite of options and here's the science behind it and here's the pros or cons um, and really help people start to have a discussion and start to see different, uh, how different solutions might be tailored to their, um, to their particular operation or if you're on the consumer side, how you can really um, start to pick different options with, um, with, within your, uh, whatever your program is around. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all these. Um, Paul did a good job of listing several of these. But when you're talking about solutions, you know, this is where you can bring in the shared values and you can put it in different frames. So we can look at, you know, how does a potential solution, what are the environmental pros and cons? Um, how does that impact uh, the market or the economic opportunities? Um, does it reduce inputs or does it increase inputs? And then the one that I think um, we don't present as well often, um, and I think we really need to tap into the social scientists at our universities, is to look at the social value of different solutions. You know, our, um, you know, this, a lot of the values or, you know, even the reasons that farmers don't adopt uh, particular practices have to do with social value. Is it a neighbor relation issue? Are there um, 
you know, are there health issues that they're worried about or time ability? Um, you know, these are all really important factors that often we don't tie into our programming as well. And so the more of these that we can present about different solutions helps us, um, helps us facilitate an effective discussion. And then finally, you know, this is one that we're probably familiar with, but it's, it's to be reminded of why success stories work so well. And so these are case studies for our project. We've done some online case studies so that they can be, you know, showcased across the U.S. Um, it's on-farm research. It's putting on conferences where you bring in people to talk about um, more farmers can come together, or consumers, or even better farmers and consumers can come together and start to talk about what's been successful, what hasn't, and how do we move forward um, to find solutions. And then finally, I wanted to leave it with... Um, there's, this is a great quote from Temple Grandin, that there's things that science can answer and then there's things that ethics can answer. And so in extension, um, we need to really think about our role in helping bring the science to the discussion, but not being hung up on necessarily having to provide the answers. We're more talking about how do we provide a process for people to improve their lives. So with that, I'll wrap up and um, say thank you for our, from our project 